I recently came upon a Vine Pair article called Seven Cocktails Your Bartender Hates Making, and then they list the cocktails, all seven of them. I thought it'd be kind of fun to react to each cocktail without actually reading the article because, oh, sorry, it's seven cocktails your bartender hates making according to Reddit. So uh, I don't know, they got a probably a wide swath of people weighing in with opinions here. Some of them are probably professional bartenders. Some of them aren't. I'm not sure what their method was as far as whose opinion they're gonna you know take seriously. Maybe they just loaded up all the responses and thought, however many people say the same thing, then that will be the thing. I'm not sure what they did, um, but I'm just gonna react to it myself. The first one here that they list is the sex on the beach. Uh, the sex on the beach is not really that much of a pain in the ass cocktail, although I will say that the person who orders the sex on the beach probably is kind of a rookie at ordering cocktails. They don't know anything about the current cocktail culture and they either got the idea from watching, you know, like Cocktail with Tom Cruise, like mo the movie, or they got an, it out of like a TV show or an antiquated just kind of idea of what cocktails are these days. It is not a very good cocktail. And so I, if somebody ordered that when I was working behind the bar, I'd be like, this person doesn't really know what they want and they're ordering something that sounds good or sounds like a viable thing to order in a bar. And I would think that they didn't really know that much. That said, I might steer them to a better drink because, you know, sex on the beach is really just, you know, I don't know. What is it like Malibu, uh, rum, vodka, like orange juice, grenadine. I mean, do we got to look this up? I don't even really remember everything that's in a sex on the beach here. Cranberry juice, orange juice, vodka. Peach schnapps. Oh, so no Malibu. I thought there was Malibu in there. Anyway, uh, yeah, so it's just not something, it's something that is fruity and sugary and, you know, it's got a little peach flavor to it and it's not very complex. I don't know, that's what I would think, I guess. The espresso martini has been having a moment over the last couple of years. I think that this espresso martini moment has been pushed forward by very smart, very strong marketing by Mr. Black, which is a coffee liqueur from Australia. They made espresso martinis into a whole thing. They created a whole competition to get people to make their own versions of espresso martinis. They've been pushing it for a very long time. And because of that is having a resurgence, like a major resurgence. It's not a pain in the ass cocktail and it is actually a very good cocktail. I would think that if a bartender didn't want to make it or they think it's a pain in the ass, it's because there are those people that are just, you know, kind of against whatever is having a moment. Like, so if something's very popular, they want to be contrary to what's popular. And so, oh, it's a big pain in their ass. The one thing I will say that is if you're in a bar that doesn't have an espresso machine, which I've worked in many bars that were like literally just bars and didn't have an espresso machine, then of course, you know, it's gonna, you're not gonna be able to make the drink, but then you just tell the customer, I can't make it. I don't have any espresso. If that person's like, I'll run out to Starbucks and get some espresso. And then maybe that would be a little bit of a pain in the ass. So if you're a customer and a bartender says that they don't have it, especially if it's very busy, don't say that you'll go get them an ingredient because nobody wants it. Let's just, just move on to another drink. It's not that important for you to have your espresso martini. Or always bring some espresso if you are in the mood for it. Or research to whether they have uh, espresso at the... Because, you know, I mean, if it's a cafe that makes cocktails and they have an espresso machine, great. If it's a high-end restaurant, usually high-end restaurants have espresso machines. Awesome. If you go into a dive bar, don't ask for it because you're just... You got to really take a look around the bar and say, will this place likely have espresso? Will they know what an espresso martini is? Okay, therefore, I will either not order one or order one. You're just based on that. The Dirty Martini. The Dirty Martini is not a cocktail that is difficult to make, and so therefore it's not a pain in the ass. What, a, what is a pain in the ass about it is that it has a bunch of different specs and nobody can agree what their preferred Dirty Martini is. There are so many different levels of like dirty, slightly dirty, medium dirty, that it's really difficult to decipher what that customer is gonna want. And so if somebody orders it and you make it your way, but they think it's too dirty or not dirty enough, that's a real pain in the ass. So I'll, I'll agree with that one. It's, but it's really about the specs. So what we should do as an industry is just standardize the dirty martini recipe and say, this is the standard so that they expect the standard unless they ask for something more dirty or slightly dirty. And so that is the way that we will get rid of this pain in the ass with the dirty martini, I guess. And what makes it dirty again? For those that don't know. Does, is there anybody that doesn't, I mean like other than like maybe somebody who's too drunk, too young to drink that doesn't know what a dirty martini is? Even people who know nothing about like cocktail culture or aren't cocktail owners, they know what a dirty martini is. But if you have been living under a rock for any length of time, a dirty martini is vodka with olive brine inside of it to make it sort of umami and you know, wonderful. I don't know. A lot of people think this is a standard martini that is not, but it is a vodka martini 
with olive brine, although you can make it with gin, but you see, this is my point. Long Island iced tea, yes, pain in the ass, but it's not, again, because of the drink. Actually, none of these are because of the drink. It's because of the customer that orders the Long Island iced tea. The Long Island iced tea famously has all of the white liquors in your well in it at the same time. When I worked in a nightclub, we would actually pick them up from the well like this, two bottles and two bottles, and pour like this. The people who ask for Long Island iced teas usually drink in clubs or sports bars who make these drinks extra, extra strong and they are just looking to get up. So anyone that's looking to get is gonna be kind of a pain in your ass. I cannot tell you the level of disappointment you see in somebody's eyes when you make them a Long Island iced tea with a half an ounce of every ingredient, like make it like a regular drink and hand it to them. They're like, this is not what I ordered because what they want is a lot of alcohol. Again, this is another one of those rookie drinker drinks that's just very, very, very famous for having a lot of alcohol. This is a very common drink that somebody will order on their 21st birthday at the behest of their friends usually. Skinny margaritas, oh, let me go on and on and on about skinny margaritas. The reason why skinny margaritas are a pain in the ass is because people don't really understand that the traditional margarita is a skinny margarita. There is no such thing as a skinny margarita. The skinny margarita, I believe, came about when a woman named Bethany Frankel that was on a show called The Real Housewives of New York City launched a brand called Skinny Girl Margarita that basically just had this margarita mix that contained the orange liqueur in it and had no sugar. The thing is, is that a regular margarita, just like a traditional margarita, is a daisy style cocktail that has Cointreau, orange liqueur, in place of sugar. And so you don't actually have any sugar content in there. This was just very smart marketing on her part, but it is not like a diet drink. It's just a drink that it has sugar in it via the Cointreau, but it doesn't have any simple syrup in it. So they call it skinny. The thing is, is that if you're really trying to lose weight, you shouldn't be drinking anything, not even tequila, nothing. The alcohol breaks down in your body like sugar. You should not drink at all if you're trying to actually lose weight. You should just drink water or something. Here you go, two ounces of clear premium tequila, a half an ounce of lime juice, this is her skinny margarita, and a splash of Grand Marnier, which has sugar, mm. or Bull's Triple Sec, also which has sugar. Bull's Triple Sec is just the off-brand of Cointreau. They're the, same, they're the same thing, basically. They claim that it's only 100 calories per serving, but it has sugar in it. There you go. The Aperol Spritz is the next one. I don't understand why this is on this, uh, this list because the Aperol spritz is literally like three or four ingredients poured into a glass over ice and then served with a wedge of orange. If you don't like making an Aperol spritz, then you just don't like making drinks because there's no shaking involved. There's no stirring involved. It's just literally built in the glass. So how could that possibly be a pain in the ass? Other than that, the Aperol spritz is having a moment and there are some contrary bartenders that just don't like making drinks that are having a moment. But you know what? I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a you problem, not a, not the customer's problem. I don't think that we can really put that on the customer this time. The I'm not sure what I want cocktail. Actually, these are my favorite kind of cocktails to have, though I'm not sure what I want cocktail. I guess when you go to a very busy nightclub or even a very busy cocktail bar, if you don't quite know what you want and you wanna have a conversation with the bartender, then that might be a little bit of a pain in the butt. It just depends on like how busy it is. If it's super busy and you don't know what you want, maybe just go to the menu and look up what cocktails they have. Look at something that you might like because I refuse to believe that there's not one thing on the menu that you would like and then order something off the menu. But if it is slow, one of my favorite things to do is to really go through flavor profiles that a customer might like and really build them something that they're really going to enjoy just based on their proclivities. I love doing that. So. I'm not sure if that's really a pain in the ass. It just really depends on the bar and its busyness and you just sort of have to read the bar and also read the bartender because not every bartender is gonna wanna do that. Not every bartender is passionate about making cocktails and that's not why they're behind the bar. So just kind of read the situation and then just kind of figure out whether or not uh, you can have a talk with them about the cocktail. But other than that, I don't think that's really much of a pain in the ass. I actually love it when people don't know what they want. And Marius thinks that we should, um, we should read and see if it matches up to what anything that I said. Okay, according to the Schmetti the Yeti. Okay. Just somebody on Reddit called Schmetti the Yeti. <laughs> the Thread's original poster, the worst cocktail to make behind the stick is the Sex on the Beach. They say the cocktail is particularly awful for its lengthy list of ingredients and is typically ordered by people who don't tip. But, okay, fine, yeah. 
it is typically ordered by people who don't tip. I'll give you that. 100% that is true. But lengthy list of ingredients? I think it has like four or five ingredients. It's not really that bad. But many of the Threads respondents were inclined to disagree, claiming it takes them all of five seconds to prepare for area sex on the beach, as most of the ingredients are typically within Zarm's reach. So basically, it is both saying it is a pain in the ass and not a pain in the ass at the same time. Yeah. Which just further proves that Vine Pair articles are solely clickbait. Like this is just a clickbait article, 100%. Despite the popularity of the espresso martini, uh, sorry, we're moving on to the espresso martini. Making them can be a huge pain, especially on busy nights that don't allow much time for pulling fresh espresso sod because that takes a long time. <laughs> Come on. I mean, if you're doing it properly with the tamping and the grinding and the thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like this. So someone's process. like, uh, here's my one thing. This is why I hate making mojitos, which is there's two drinks that I hate making. Some of them are like reasonable to hate making and then one of them is just not and the mojito is one that i hate making because it is a little bit time consuming the way that i make it mm -hmm. and then on top of that as soon as you put one out everyone else is like i want a mojito too and then all of a sudden you are making 50 mojitos someone goes oh this is the best mojito i ever had because anytime i make a drink it's the best drink they've ever had and then once somebody hears that it's like everybody else at the bar wants to order the same drink i'll have what she's having which is really a pain in the ass. The other one is the Bloody Mary, which is not very reasonable because literally the way that we made Bloody Marys at Kohl's was that we had like Bloody Mary mix that was pre-batched that we made ahead of time. We had that in the fridge. It was just half an ounce of lime, half an ounce of lemon, two ounces of vodka, Bloody Mary mix. You roll it between two things and then garnish it. It was just a pain in the ass because the garnishing was like a little extravagant and it's like, it's just a lot, you know? And if you're making a lot of those, it's it's just not, but it, it's not very reasonable, but, but I, I don't like making yeah, I guess, I guess if you're, you know, properly making your espresso martini shots, it would be a pain in the ass to pull the espresso. It's fine. Somebody said, though, in this article, they said, uh, should they, should customers have to pay for the cocktail as well as their shot of espresso for the inconvenience? <laughs> that would be kind of oh. Especially because there's probably like, you know, $4 worth of ingredients inside an espresso martini, or maybe $5 of ingredients in there. And they're paying like triple the price. They're paying 15 to $18. They shouldn't have to pay for the espresso shot, dude. That's crazy. I mean, and what are you gonna charge for an espresso shot? Like two fifty, three dollars $3? Okay, dirty martinis in the era of the martini mania that has defined the past three years, there is no shortage of teenies to choose from. Some bartenders have had enough, especially when the drinks are ordered dirty. One Redditor's post bemoans a lack of brine and all of specifications while others cite the annoyance of some guests' particular specs. Yeah, that's basically what I said. That lines up. Long Island Ice Teas. While some cocktails are hated for their ingredients, others are loathed because of the people who tend to order them. Hmm. I did touch on this. People are just wanting to get drunk. All I hear when they get ordered is, I'm going to be a needy douchebag and you'll be lucky if I give you 25 cents. <laughs> what? what is this, the Long Island Ice Tea? Yeah. <laughs> they, when when the bar the bartender saying that whatever they all that they hear from the customer that orders it is I'm going to be a needy douchebag all night. Do you have uh, do you have organic vodka? <laughs> You'll be lucky if I get to give you a twenty five cent tip. <laughs> That's so true though. Why don't you do the guy that gets the fuck out of here before I call security? Besides the obvious issues associated with calling any drink skinny, several bartenders have an issue with the cocktail because one when one guest orders one, others at the table feel pressured to too. Other users lament the skinny margarita because there aren't hard rules on what exactly makes a drink skinny. A lack of sugar, less tequila, and what in the world are people looking for when they order a margarita extra skinny? Yeah, I, I'd like to know that too, actually. And that's pretty funny. Aperol spritzes served in a wine glass with an expressive orange hue. Aperol spritzes are as delicious as they are eye-catching, but similarly to the skinny margarita, the Aperol tends to carry a flashy fajita effect. Sparking interest across, oh, fajita effect. I guess the fajita oh, effect like, is what ooh, it sparks. I want that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was talking about with the mojito just yeah. now. Yeah, like, but I, that's the fajita effect. Like, because like when someone gets like a sizzling plate of fajitas, yeah, like, they're like, what ooh, is that? <laughs> what's that person eating? <laughs> that, that looks good. <laughs> smells great. <laughs> then there's the stress of building a drink and serving it in a wine glass during slammed services, which can, that's, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. And then the, what, the I'm not sure what I want cocktail. While some bartenders may be annoyed by intricate bills or highly specific requests some uh, from guests, some grow hot under the collar when guests aren't sure what they want. Not only does this have the potential to waste the staff's time, but more often than not, guests may end up ordering something standard rather than trying something new. If you, if you don't, know what you want, take some time to figure it out before asking your bartender what's good. But the thing is, is that like, I mean, I always like to say like when people are like, what's good? It's like, 
the menu. Like we spent a long time building this menu. Whatever's on the menu is what we think is good. Uh, if they order something standard though, that is like uninspired and that irritates the bartender, that's usually because the bartender pushed them to something standard because they don't want to take the time to kind of figure out what they want and give them a good cocktail. They're just like, oh, I don't know. Do you like whiskey? It's an old fashioned. Right. Like whatever, you know, because they just don't want to deal with it. Uh, okay. I mean, not a complete waste of time of an article. I don't know. I don't know if we got some insight in here. I kind of feel like I dropped a little knowledge on some cocktails. So I don't know. Do with this video what you will. Hopefully it was fun to watch. I am not entertained. And I'll see you guys some other time. You know, I don't know. Maybe next week. Maybe not. Who knows? Who knows what's happening with this channel? Today's episode is sponsored by ourselves. One of the most important things about cocktails is their presentation. And your garnish game can really make or break that presentation. So Marius and I decided that we wanted to start making some dehydrated fruit. Not only are they beautiful to look at, they're pretty long lasting and they're functional garnishes. All of our citrus are sourced locally and this is a really good way to help the channel. The garnishes are made in small batches. They're essentially made to order. So head to the shop and no coupon code needed because they're amazingly priced and it helps the channel.